we recognize that Kotmetch is a celebration that symbolizes the emancipation of African Bermudians. It's a festive time of the year where Bermudians come together collectively across all spectrums, whether it's religious, political, economic, or social. So it's a wonderful opportunity for Bermudians to eliminate the labels and recognize the significance of us as human beings and what it is that we have accomplished, our ancestors have accomplished, and celebrate under one cause. So I do believe there's a connection and a link between sport, the game of cricket, and emancipation. But how do we educate our people in terms of the significance of emancipation? We seem to celebrate it and make much ado, and we should, during the one time a year when we talk about cup match. But it is my opinion and belief that perhaps we need to do it much more regularly. With emancipation comes responsibility. We have to be responsible as free people to educate our young, young and old, about what transpired and how we move ourselves forward in the 21st century. Yes, the people that you meet Smile at you out on the street That's how it is in Bermuda Everybody says hello Folks you don't even know yeah. That's how it is in Bermuda That's how it is, baby that's how it is, oh yeah, that's how it is in Bermuda. We're very comfortable celebrating emancipation from a ceremonial standpoint, but I think there's much work to be done with respect to talking about freedom. My name is Radal Tankett. I'm currently an education officer in the Department of Education. And I serve as a member of the Emancipation Committee in the Department of Community and Cultural Affairs. I've also served as a deputy chair to the African Diaspora Heritage Trail Conference Committee and so have done some work with respect to promoting African history and the significance of it on the island. There is the view that one may raise the question about why I focus on slavery. And I think whilst it's a painful experience, if we are to ever heal, it is important that we reflect on what has transpired in the past. The abolition of slavery here in Bermuda with the Emancipation Proclamation in 1834 was just that, emancipation by law. Heritage Productions makes the argument that emancipation is more than being free. And part of the healing process is talking about it and sharing it comfortably throughout the year. Not just on August 1 when we celebrate and commemorate Cup Match but with an ongoing effort to cleanse and heal ourselves. My name is Maxine Esdale. I am the chairperson of the African Diaspora Heritage Trail Bermuda Foundation. The ADHT was seen as an opportunity to encourage heritage tourism, to put out the importance of African culture, African heritage, and the opportunity to encourage persons to explore it by traveling to various sites of memory across Bermuda. 
so there are a variety of sites across Bermuda from St. George's all the way up to Dockyard that tell the story of Bermudians of African descent in their journey to Bermuda and what they've done since they've been in Bermuda. And so what they do is speak to the history and culture of African Bermudians. So to me, that's the biggest thing. Understanding that we come from a rich culture, that we have lots of things that make us the positive people that we are. And we should always want to tell our story. It's not only about what happened, it's about what the potential is for us as a people. If we recognize that we were builders and architects and entrepreneurs and financiers when it was really hard, then we definitely have the potential to do those things as we move forward. So that's the kind of reality that I think ADHD brings and that's what it means to me. My name is Angela Barry and I have a kind of parallel life teaching at the Bermuda College, teaching English and writing. When I came back to Bermuda in 1990, there was nothing on the books at the college under the heading of Bermuda literature. We had a few kind of big moments. There was the Tempest which provided a kind of framework for the European view of not just Bermuda, but the New World. Then we had the voice of Mary Prince. She lived and died in the late 18th and into the 19th century, but Bermuda didn't know anything about her until, until the end of the 20th century. And then there was basically nothing. A combination of things such as historical documents, essays, articles, newspaper accounts, a little bit of writing, but very little. So we don't have a lot of instances of writing based in that time, but um, I think there's rich territory for all of that. And that's really what contemporary writers are mining and last year, following the endowment to the College of the Brian Berland Archive, we're able now to produce a 14-week course looking at Bermudian literature. I believe the modern-day impact of slavery has much to do with self-doubt. It manifests itself in whether or not we believe in who we are as individuals which begins to demoralize the spirit. And that's the cultural piece which should come into light. And so I believe that the modern day impact is reflective and indicative of how some of our young people are conducting themselves, antisocial behaviors and the like. That's not to say that that's the sole reason, but part of it has to do with them not understanding who they are, where they've come from, and part of their personal responsibility. The Cotmatch Classic itself, this year will be 111 years in operation. And so during that course of the time, there have been a tremendous amount of individuals who've participated in the game, who have entertained the public, who've demonstrated good sportsmanship, good character. Heritage Production is an organization which was created some nine years ago, thereabouts. And we decided to put together an awards ceremony Emancipation Awards luncheons to find a way to honor and acknowledge African Bermudians who've made significant contribution to not only the cultural and athletic way of life here on the island, but as well as academic and political. And so we identify persons who have made significant contribution in terms of enhancing Bermuda's cultural heritage. If anybody is any familiarity with the lodges at all, you would know that if you spot our regalias, you have scarlet, you have a royal blue, you have a pale blue, and you have a winter blue. And you look at your cop match colors, that's what you have. It came out of the order. My name is Joy Wilson Tucker. I was born and raised in Pembroke. 
I became a member of the Friendly Society Order in 1973. Cup match for us is very significant. As I've been told, the reasons why the cup match started, the friendly societies used to go once a year to have a picnic. And at that picnic, they would play cricket because all of them had cricket teams. So the cricket just flourished around many of the black clubs. And it became so popular that they decided that they would offer a cup. So I think the first game took place in 1902, up in Somerset. So that was something that was instilled in, in your Black Lodges, if basically with cricket games and, and how it came about. And I'm hoping that it will never get destroyed or even moved from the East End and the West End because it's really deeply a part of our history. One of the benefits that I have found just in the two years that I've been here is the willingness for people to learn more about the diaspora. Like, oh, I didn't know about that. Um, tell me about it. One of our main sites is Pilot Darrell Square in St. George's, which speaks of Pilot Jemmy Darrell, who was made the first black king's pilot in the 1700s. He bought that piece of property there. The property's been in the family ever since that time. So, Jeremy Dow is an important cultural icon for us because he was the first person who was a slave who became a King's pilot and whose family has become a part of the ADHD. They really take it on and are very proud of what their great, 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 great seventh removed father did. Slavery is not that long ago, and so if my ancestors or people who just one or two generations from me can do those things and could have persevered in that time, not just persevered but prospered, then I in this 21st century definitely should be able to do something positive. And so as we go forward, one of our main focus will be on educating particularly young people about the rich history that is theirs and that they are a part of that history. It's not just the history out there, it's like, I'm a part of that because I came from people who were pilots and could navigate through the shores and the shoals that we have around Bermuda. I came from people who were financiers, who had import-export businesses, who bought property all over Bermuda. So it's necessary because, you know, there's the old adage, you don't know where you're going until you know where you came from. With the first sentence of the history of Mary Prince, a West Indian slave related by herself. I was born in Brackish Pond in Bermuda. So Mary Prince was born in the late 18th century. Brackish Pond is Devonshire Marsh. She lived, I guess, in slavery terms. It was quite a pleasant childhood because she was with her mother and her, her siblings. They all lived together. But of course, she was sold off when she was 12 and the kind of sense of what slavery meant began there. So she had a series of owners, and I think it was because she had that base of a family life, she could recall what it meant to be a human, really, that she resisted the rest of her life, the imposition of this system on her person. She was outraged when she was abused and physically assaulted and sold off. So Mary Prince eventually ended up in England and she just took her freedom because she was free in England. And she came upon, 
a group of abolitionists, and it was through her association with them that her her history, the history, her narrative was published in 1831, just when all of the parliamentary debates were going on. And it was used in those debates to show the reality of slavery in the colonies. And Mary Prince's narrative talks about what it was like to be a slave during those times. It gives you the actual experience, gives you the physical experience, it gives you the psychological experience, the, the desire above all other things to be free, to own your own life. If you think about what it must have been like in those two plus hundred years for people being born into that situation with absolutely no hope of it going away, ever, how they actually managed. And Mary Prince's narrative helped them to do that. And three years later, we had the, uh, the proclamation of emancipation. So she has a huge historical role Certainly not just in Bermuda terms, but in terms of the whole of the Atlantic world. So her story feeds into the whole process of making this system illegal. And sometime, I think in the 1970s or 80s, Henry Louis Gates included her in the four classic slave narratives. So you'll find Mary Prince in women's studies, in Caribbean studies, in African-American studies. She's just everywhere. But she wasn't known to us. We didn't know her story. We didn't know the significance of her story to the whole abolition movement. And we didn't see ourselves in Mary Prince. Well, we couldn't because we didn't know about her. So Mary Prince is just I mean, central is just not even <laughs> good enough, you know. It is so critical. She's absolutely the rock out of which all of the writing that is about that theme of race, it all stems from her description of that experience. When the Enterprise ship came here, it was caught up in a storm and it was blown into the Bonito Shores in February of 1835. It was reported that there was just cargo on there. There were no people on there that was initially reported. There were a few individuals that were being nosy, I guess, and they went looking and they found out that there were 78 slaves and some of them were infant babies, as young as three years old, and one or two, if I remember correctly, the women were pregnant. So they reported it. And so they held a court case, took him to court, and they asked every one of the slaves individually if you want to stay here in the island or if you would like to leave, because we had just received our freedom. And all except one woman with her five children said they would stay. And so the members of the order decided that we have to do something to help these people. And the lodge members found homes and jobs and whatever for, you know, for them to stay. We managed to trace some of them and we're continuing to research to find out what might have happened to some of the others. And the reason I'm continuing to trace this is because I'm connected with the Bermudian Heritage Museum and I want to keep that history going in the museum. The sites of memory have been officially recognized by UNESCO Slave Trail Project. And so we also uh, continue to look into 
What other sites are there that we are not aware of that we need to add to the trail because they tell the story? And for me, the sites of memory are about reminding us of the story of African Bermudians, not only of what we did, but what we have the potential to do. And so that to me is the example. It's about the fact that the stories that we have are so positive and the trail is actually the physical reminders of that, that we have the human capacity to take what we have and use it to move me on personally and in doing that I move my family, I move my country. So it's not that um, these people are old a long time ago and I didn't have anything to do with them. It's about the process of looking at how they use what they had to do what it is that they had to do. And now, how do I take what I know 300, 400 years later and contribute to my society, my country, and the world? We give of ourselves from the friendly societies. We give in kind of duties to our people teaching and things like that. The Lodge has been very instrumental in the building up of our society here in Bermuda. When they initially started out, the object of the order was to take care of their people, to educate them, to bury them, look after them when they're sick. So it's a significant organization and one to be proud of. But so much of the history, I think, is buried where people don't know anything about it. Our mandate is to get out and help our fellow man. That's it. Secret societies came from way back in slavery time because it was decided that in order to help our people, we would have to organize. So the type of people that came here as large members would have been mostly your lower class or middle class folk. Some just came in for assistance, and once they got here, they stayed. You'd be amazed at the amount of persons that were associated with the order that were business owners, like John G. Bassett, Ray P. Williams, Clarence Darrell. And we made no distinction between color. Mr. John Barrett Sr. Sr. was a member of this order, and he was a white man. So it's people who were culturally minded and wanted to see the bath for their people. Organizations like the Friendly Society have a vital role to play with respect to post-emancipation. Many of the members were free blacks who saw fit to open the doors and make a concerted effort to assist in this whole process of emancipation, to ensure that African Bermudians live to some degree a free life, a sustainable life, a balanced life coming out of slavery. And so the role of the friendly societies, they cannot be denied. Brian Berland was a very talented and gifted writer, and he was a very courageous man. I really take my hat off to him for his courage in revealing aspects of Bermuda that had not been revealed before and of showing that despite the fact that he was born into a, a privileged white family that he could look with a dispassionate eye on the society that he lived in which was founded on a history of total inequality, exploitation and so on. The two books that look specifically at race are The Sailor and the Fox and Surprise. The Sailor and the Fox is a story about a boxing match between the aging white champ and the new, young, beautiful, talented black contender. And he sets it in the 1950s, during the time of the theater boycott, that's the setting. So, a totally segregated society. And we have the racial groups just lined up, each of them baying for the blood of the other. And as a very exciting match, but it's also a metaphor for this rising black presence 
and the white presence that had really seen its best days. Surprise is a book that can easily be placed within the context of Caribbean literature. This was post-emancipation. We have a group of disaffected Bermudians and they found that they were still being flogged and really brutalized. And Surprise and his group builds a Bermuda sloop and sails down to the Caribbean to set up the Republic of New Bermuda because nothing was possible in the old Bermuda. You needed to start from scratch. This is quite an amazing concept. And it is a very uplifting story. And it ends in an optimistic way. But I think he got two reactions from his own community. He would have been seen as a traitor. That's my view, that he would have been seen as somebody giving up all of the secrets, who was not playing the game according to the rules. And then, in terms of the black community, they didn't want to hear anything from any white man talking about them. Because he was writing in the 60s and the 70s, and black people had only just started to feel that they had a voice that was going to be listened to. So for him to actually become the kind of writer he wanted to be, he needed to be away from Bermuda. A lot of writers have done that. Uh, you write from exile. You look at a distance at the community that has created you and write in exile. The Caribbean writers almost all did that. Young people tell us all the time, we don't have a culture. There is no culture in Bermuda. And that's part of the fact that because we were colonized, because we were enslaved, we do not have a good sense of self and we don't think we need to know self and this self is not important in any way. So we need to reverse that story and one of the ways we do it is with the sites of memory. Cobbs Hill Methodist Church is a church that was built by slaves. It is located on Moonlight Lane in Warwick and it was built by slaves at night because they had to do it after they were working. And I think it's compelling to see a group of people who worked from sunup to sundown and later, then after all of that work, to say it's important enough for me to have a place where I need to worship. And I want to have my own place to worship because you recognize that in that time, blacks often were not able to worship in other churches or if they did, they were put somewhere up in the balcony or out the back. And in spite of being tired, to take the time for years to build it out of Bermuda stone. So that is a memorial to dedication, faith, belief in God, and an understanding of the importance of something for their family, because I know that they didn't just do it for themselves, they did it so that into perpetuity that persons would have a place to worship free um, and sit anywhere they wanted to. And the persons who are custodians of the church at the moment, again, people who are so proud of their history, and it grounds them in who they are. And so it has a very active young people's group. So it's a church built by slaves in 1821, but still going strong. There was a Reverend Pancreas around in what they would call the poor areas of Pembroke. And he saw the suffering that was taking place because blacks weren't allowed to go into the hospitals for treatment. So he approached the friendly societies and ask them what they consider building a hospital so that they would be able to treat these people. And so the various lodges came together and that's how their cottage hospital came into existence. And they would support the nurses, any nurses that wanted to learn nursing and what have you, that they would support it. It was a struggle for a lot of the nurses because even though they went and qualified themselves, they still wouldn't allow them to come back and work in the hospital. So we trained many of the black nurses from their era. And attached to this large room, they built the first mineral water factory, colonial mineral water factory. And so there was always an enterprise type of something that they were doing in order to help. 
I would like to mention in terms of emancipation and the legacy of emancipation, the play Emancipation, a Love Story by Kim Dismont Robinson, which looks at the history of Bermuda, starting from the first peoples coming from Africa. And we have this great stretch of time that takes us to the Middle Passage, slavery, emancipation, all the way through contemporary Bermuda with guys being shot and people not knowing what to do. It's good. And he took half a while with him and he left. And we have a couple, a man and a woman, I guess the foundation of a family, trying to live, trying to love, and trying not to let go of the promise, the covenant between them and this ancestral spirit. The Goomba. Ah, I have called you, and you have come. Who is the spirit of Africa. We have always done, have this, always amongst done this among our people. Papa Gumba sounds a call for a message to be shared, and you are no doubt wondering why I have called you. So it is a marvelously conceived work. And in the middle of it, we have emancipation. 1834! And I guess the point of that section is that it's just a piece of paper, really. What's going to happen next? How are we actually going to be free when all we have known is this? And this is the thing that is still pretty remarkable. I think they managed. And I think they managed because Gumba was still there. He was still whispering in their ears and that's why they learned how to be Gombes. And in America, they got the spirituals. In the Caribbean, they had Anansi. Anansi, shriveled to a small and blackened spider on this journey. That's how they survived. But wow. I mean, when we think of our struggles now, and we try to compare them with that, it is, our struggles are of a different nature. Their struggles were physical, but it was very, very emotional as well, very psychological as well. Our struggles are much more of a psychological nature. So that is a very important piece of work. It talks about the leading up to emancipation, and then what happens later. And we're still connected to it, all of us. That's not to say that there has been no progress, no movement, obviously there has been, obviously. But there are still issues of the psyche which uh, we are all struggling with. It's like I hear these voices in my head telling me that my brain is full, that I'm not a man. Don't you dare blame those voices. Don't you dare blame them. You listen, and you listen to me well, Christopher. There is no one in this room that matters but the two of us. Nobody. If you can find a way to walk through this with me, it will all have been worth it. We'll be free. We'll be free? This idea started more than 10 years ago in Little Bermuda, which is out in the middle of nowhere where a lot of people don't know us. Um, and it's a concept that has taken on and taken hold internationally in a number of like organizations. Each of us within the diaspora and across the world have unique stories to tell. And I think we each need to know each other's culture because that helps you to understand who I am. If we understood that we each had a journey, every culture has a journey, and we need to understand everyone's journey so that we can appreciate where it is we are. And so the opportunity to understand each other, I think is what the ADHD allows us to do. We recognize that this is bigger than Bermuda. This is a concept 
that truly spreads across the diaspora. And we were able to take what it is that we have in this country and turn it into a story that allows us to share our history with the world. I believe that we've made tremendous progress. I do believe that we have a ways to go. I think where we've fallen in some cases, or where Bermudians have dropped the ball, is that we fail to tell the story to our children, to our offsprings. And I'm not blaming anyone in particular. You know, the economic boom came, everyone tried to succeed, and people trying to do well with their families and all of that, and something gets lost in the process. And it's unfortunate, but part of their history gets lost. Education, for me, in my understanding, first begins at home. It's telling the story. And so if we begin to look at and appreciate our ancestors, where they've come from, the resilience of their forefathers and mothers, all of it is a part of the Bermudian heritage, the Bermudian experience. And I think if we look close enough and hard enough, yeah, there's much to be proud of. There's much to be proud of. I wrote a book called Gore, Point of Departure, written nothing about uh, Bermuda, but it is about people from one side of the Atlantic dealing with people of the African diaspora on the other. It focuses on the island of Gore, which used to be a slave port right off the coast of Senegal, and millions of enslaved Africans went through there to, to go to the Americas. So this was a place that I went to for the first time in my 20s. And seeing Gore was a very big moment, a very big deal for me, seeing that doorway of no return. And so that had to be the core metaphor, if you like, of the book, where the relationship between these two parties which is full of misunderstanding and so on, had to somehow return to Gore, to the moment when they were separated. That is what has to be confronted. That has to be somehow laid to rest. Not buried, but it's there. And both sides have to come to terms with it in some way. I didn't in any way expect Gore Point of Departure to be particularly successful in Bermuda, but it has been. It has been very, very well received <coughs> in Bermuda. It was a very contemporary story, but it had that ancient quality. That's something that I, as a writer, must do. I have to have both. I have to have today and I have to have yesterday. They must be there if there's going to be any tomorrow, you know. So I can't look at what goes on in Bermuda, the shooting and whatever. I can't look at that without seeing further back, going back a long way. Because what happens now is not something that has just, you know, somehow emerged out of nothing. It has emerged out of a very, very long process. We only have about seven or eight orders that are now remaining in existence. I'm going to be honest enough to say that they're not going strong. Most of our members are in declining years. Maybe one of our youngest might be in their middle 40s. So all of them are struggling for membership. We are looking at trying to make some basic changes to see if we can get younger members to come in and become a part of the order because it would be a shame to let it go. When I first came in, I was a bit timid. I didn't know what to expect. What I've learned through this lodge is how to do a proper minute, how to amend a motion, how to do bookkeeping, how to do secretarial work, how to present myself, how to make speeches. It just gives you confidence and it builds character.
you can walk out into this world and you can hold yourself up against anybody. So to me, I would tell any young person, if you really want to be educated, not just how to conduct yourself out in society, but to learn your history, the Lodge is the place to be. My father was a proud Bermudian to the end. But he did not know his history. He was a proud Bermudian because Bermudian was his beautiful place. And he just loved his family and he loved Bermuda. But he didn't know any of the other kinds of historical things that the ADHT trail has highlighted. My goal is to bring the ADHT home to remind people of those unique stories, to have us as Bermudians recognize, here is why Jeremy Dow Square is important. Here is why the Whipping Post in St. George's is important. Because this is about understanding ourselves, being proud of ourselves, and so that when we talk about Bermuda, we talk about it in that way. So the ADHT trail over time has been able to allow us to unearth those um, pieces of history that make us uniquely Bermudian. All parts of it, because there is the African experiences, the European experience, and others also, because it wasn't only Africans who would have come here and had to be slaves or indentured. And we have the opportunity to share them the way that says we are each and every one proud of who we are and where we came from and what we will be as we move forward. And when we educate ourselves and our own populace about it, we can go back to that pride that my father used to have being in Bermuda because we come from a rich culture. And so we should always want to tell our story because this is what our story is and we have a good story to tell. Among contemporary poets, Jane Downing's poem, in which I think the refrain is something about my blood is tainted and it just won't go away. So here we have a white Bermudian looking at this historical thing that's strapped to her back. And she has confronted it. Many people did not. Just say, well, that was a long time ago. I didn't do anything personally. I didn't do anything personally. But we have those kind of investigations happening in the literature that's coming out of Bermuda right now. I think we all have a different role to play. You know, we can't say, well, that's not necessary or that part's not necessary. We all have to do what we can do best. The young people who are now involved in performance poetry, slam poetry, spoken word, artistry, I take my hat off to them. It's a very empowering thing that they're doing. And I recognize that they are also part of this whole thing. So that's the only thing I would say in terms of Bermudian literature coming to grips with this and all other issues is that we need to push ourselves to, to be the best that we can be and recognize that we all have different things to, to say which will contribute to a more vibrant cultural landscape. And I think that's it. <laughs>
Is it really true? That's how it is in Bermuda. All the flowers and the birds, too beautiful for words, yeah. That's how it is in Bermuda. Oh, yes, that's how it is, baby. That's how it is, oh, yeah. That's how it is in Bermuda. Sunset that you never will forget. Yeah. That's how it is in Bermuda. You'll have a turn your eye, and it's time to say goodbye. Yeah. That's how it is in Bermuda. That's how it is, baby. That's how it is. Yeah. That's how it is. Down in Bermuda, oh yeah. 